Today we turn our attention to entrepreneurs, one of the most critical links to our economy, entrepreneurs who are the thinkers who can take an idea from concept to fruition. They are the risk takers, the bootstrappers and innovators we depend on to create jobs and spur economic growth. Entrepreneurs represent what is great about America. It is about opportunity, innovation and hard work. It is never easy to start a company. In today's economy, it is an even greater challenge. The trend in entrepreneurship is up, but an entrepreneur's ability to hire is down. The recession's high unemployment rates may have encouraged people to start sole proprietorships, but there are many obstacles in the way of growing a company to create jobs. One of our witnesses today, Heath Hall, and his business partner started their company in the middle of a recession. Friends and family members thought they were crazy, but they wanted to prove that a small business could succeed if it was founded by entrepreneurs with a good work ethic, a great product, and people that believed in them. They wanted to prove that the free market is still the best path for success for entrepreneurs. This afternoon, we are going to hear from witnesses who will discuss the current state of, of the entrepreneurship and risks and rewards and challenges of building a company. And we look forward to hearing your testimony. Uh, again, keep mine short since I am tardy, uh, but I will now yield to the Ranking Member Velasquez for her opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Graves. Our nation's 20, 29 million small firms are the cornerstone of our economy. They employ half of all private sector employees. Over the past 15 years, they generated two-thirds of new jobs. Clearly, given these facts, entrepreneurs will be essential to our economic recovery. All small businesses help the economy grow, but it is the opportunity entrepreneurs that hold the most potential for job creation. These new, fast-growing firms develop cutting-edge products, often revolutionizing entire industries. Encouraging these innovators to turn their dreams into reality benefits the entire economy. By creating brand new markets and sparking competition, these firms often have a multiplier effect on job creation. As older businesses seek to compete in newly created markets, they too add workers to the payroll. This spirit of entrepreneurship has always been part of our national identity and remains so today. In fact, close to 565,000 new businesses per month were created in 2010, the highest level over the past decade. During today's hearing, we will examine how these innovators are contributing to our recovery and the hurdles they face in creating new jobs. Before the recession, starting a business simply required a good idea, hard work, and Internet access. But in today's turbulent times, forming a business is more challenging. The financial crisis presented a unique set of challenges for small firms seeking capital. As lending standards tightened, entrepreneurs found it more difficult to secure loans and lines of credit. While this situation has improved, there is still a long way to go. SBA loan programs have played a critical role in bridging these gaps, growing providing startups with access to capital they need to launch and expand. Another critical area to businesses' success is technical assistance. SBA's program assists entrepreneurs by providing tailored education on topics ranging from marketing to procurement to international trade. For a startup, this expertise can often make the difference between failure and long-term growth. Initiatives like the Small Business Development Centers have proven effective in channeling counseling and assistance to millions of entrepreneurs across the country. While the SBDC network is the SBA's largest such program, it faces challenges in the form of reduced budgets and rising demand for its services. Today, we will hear how the SBDC network is adjusting to these fiscal realities and what can be done to help it carry out its mission of assisting small firms. Startups and small businesses are critical to our nation's long-term prosperity. Currently, this sector's growth is largely fueled by immigrants, entrepreneurs, and older professionals launching new ventures. As the face of entrepreneurship is changing, strategies for supporting these ventures must also evolve. Today's hearing will provide the committee's insights into how to tackle this challenge, identify areas where entrepreneurs face the greatest obstacle, and help the committee craft practical solutions to these problems. In advance to, of their testimony, I also want to thank all the witnesses for participating. Your testimony provides valuable insight into critical topics, and we appreciate your being here. With that, I thank the Chairman and yield back. <coughs> 
first, our first witness is going to be Andrew. You're going to have to pronounce it. Ruzak, huh? Rosky. Okay. Well, I appreciate uh, you pronouncing it for me. I'm terrible with names. Rosky. Who is a, he's an adjunct professor at the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. Uh, professor Rosky teaches courses on innovation and is founder of the Andrew Rosky Companies. He works with organizations seeking growth through the creation and introduction of new ideas. Um, he's a best-selling author and an expert on creativity and innovation. And he earned his MBA from Loyola University in Chicago and has an undergraduate degree in international business affairs from Bradley University. Welcome. And uh, to kind of explain to you, guys, you all have five minutes and try to keep it within that uh, if possible. Great. Mr. Thank Rosky. You. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Gray's Ranking Member Velasquez, members of the committee, uh, good afternoon. My name is Andrew Rosge, and I am a lecturer at the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. I'm also uh, an advisor to organizations on innovation and growth and an active angel investor in startups. And pleased to be here today to provide testimony for today's hearing. As you know, small businesses are instrumental to our economy. As we heard, they employ 50 percent of the private sector workers and are responsible for 60 percent of new jobs. I've outlined several factors in my written testimony. However, for now, I'd like to focus really on two principles. Uh, the first is that not all entrepreneurs become entrepreneurs for the same reasons. Uh, for some, entrepreneurship is a choice. They want to work for themselves, or uh, they've got a problem that they're looking to solve. For others, entrepreneurship is a necessity. They are typically the victims of job loss and start businesses to create income for themselves. And for others still, entrepreneurship is their destiny. These are members of multi-generation family businesses. And as their paths differ, so too do their motivations, and these motivations are instrumental to keep in mind as we create good policy. Second, beyond their origins, uh, it is important also to distinguish between small business owners and high potential entrepreneurs. Uh, these two groups differ significantly in their skills, their funding needs, their challenges, and the social networks that they need to succeed. Um, so what are the differences and what are the implications? Well, let me just share a quick story with you. Ray Kroc, who we all know is the legendary founder of McDonald's, or the one who grew that business, uh, was a high potential entrepreneur. Uh, creates today one and a half million employees, and several million employees have worked for that company for many, many decades. The McDonald brothers, on the other hand, uh, who invented the concept in San Bernardino, California in 1940, were small business owners. Their goal was to sell hamburgers and shakes and to do it really, really fast. Uh, while the McDonald brothers saw the potential of their idea, they wanted it to remain a small business. Ray, on the other hand, also saw the potential, but he had aspired to grow the business. Uh, ultimately, Ray became frustrated with that, and so he acquired the brothers and built what we know today as McDonald's. The differences between the McDonald brothers and Ray Kroc go well beyond their aspirations, however. The small business owners and high potential entrepreneurs also differ in their skills, their challenges, their funding needs, and their social networks. First, in terms of skills, typically a small business is concerned with uh, creating income for themselves, as I mentioned earlier, and therefore leveraging their own skills. High potential entrepreneurs are really in the business of creating businesses. So in the United States, 10 percent of entrepreneurs, for example, create 30 percent of our new businesses. 20 percent of our entrepreneurs create over half of our new businesses. These are a different group, and these are what I call our high potential entrepreneurs. Second, they have very different challenges. Uh, small businesses primarily are concerned generally with cash flow and therefore are typically interested in lowering their tax burdens. Uh, high potential entrepreneurs, on the other hand, are interested in really scaling their businesses. So their biggest challenges are A, attracting capital, uh, and B, attracting and hanging, hanging on to talent. Uh, so high potential entrepreneurs can only hope someday to pay taxes. Uh, third, they really differ in the sources of capital. Uh, small businesses typically seek, seek as we know, uh, funding from banks and microloans, the majority of their funding from there, while high potential entrepreneurs rarely set foot in banks, uh, primarily because they have no collateral other than their dream and their vision that we know. So while small businesses really trade on their collateral and interest, high potential entrepreneurs trade on capital gains and equity with their, with their investors. And finally, they really maintain different social networks, uh, whereas small businesses typically network locally as members of their chambers of commerce and other organizations. High potential entrepreneurs typically are networking globally uh, through venture accelerators and incubators and the like. So while vo both are vital to our recovery, certainly small business owners and high potential entrepreneurs, because of these differences, uh, my recommendation is that we really think about these entities and manage them uh, differently. Uh, why is that the case? Uh, as you look at high potential entrepreneurs, for example, they're generally backed by venture capital. And venture-backed businesses are more resilient in economic downturns and more prosperous typically over the long term. Uh, moreover, they have exponential economic impact. For example, if you look at the investments made in high potential businesses, although it's only 2%, 0.2%, excuse me, of GDP, 
the revenue they generate is equivalent to 21 percent of U.S. GDP. So very, very uh, high performing companies. So generally for these reasons, the differences in their skills, their needs, their funding requirements, their social networks that make them succeed, you know, my recommendation is that we need to focus just as much on these high potential entrepreneurs uh, as we do on the typical small business challenges. So, thank you. Thank you, Professor Roski. Um, our next, next witness is Seth Goldman, who is the president of Honest Tea in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, as a youngster, Mr. Goldman had newspaper routes and lemonade stands. Um, he nearly pursued a prize-winning biotechnology idea before he co-founded the Honest Tea uh, brand in his kitchen in 1998. Is that correct? correct? He's a graduate of Harvard College and the Yale School of Management, and he's testifying on behalf of the American Beverage Association. Uh, welcome, Mr. Goldman. Thank you. Good afternoon. Usually when there's a discussion about high-growth businesses, the focus is on the Internet or biotech. Um, so I'm here to be happy to be here to represent a part of the economy everyone understands. Uh, we make uh, low sugar organic beverages, and over, over the 14 years, our continuous double-digit growth has created 122 jobs in 22 states. These are jobs that create and support manufacturing across the United States, and jobs that can't be shipped overseas. In 1998, I launched Honest Tea out of my kitchen. Uh, my co-founder and I brewed five thermoses of tea, and we got an uh, empty Snapple bottle and stuck on a label and brought it to the local Whole Foods buying office. And uh, to our great delight, surprise, and horror, the buyer said uh, he was going to buy 15,000 bottles, so we had to go home and figure out how to make that much tea. Um, we launched in the 17 Whole Foods stores in the Mid-Atlantic and gave away more samples than we sold, but by the end of that summer, we were the best-selling tea in those stores, and then we expanded from there to the rest of the Whole Foods chain and then became the best-selling tea in the natural foods industry. And just last year, Coca-Cola uh, purchased our company, which is still run out of Bethesda, Maryland. When we started, uh, my co-founder and I raised money from who, basically the people who couldn't say no, you know, uh, ourselves, uh, our parents, my sister, his roommates from college. Um, and over the next 10 years, we raised $10 million in angel capital uh, in, in, from equity. And so how do we manage to stay in business over that time while a lot of other beverage companies started and, and went under? Well, first, we offered something that was clearly different. Uh, while everyone else was selling a tea with, with a lot of sugar, we were offering something with just one to two teaspoons. Uh, and then in 1999, we became the first company to create an organic bottled tea. So once again, we had a point of difference in the marketplace. The other way we stayed in business is we, just, we, we were careful with our cash. Uh, instead of paying for radio and TV ads, we developed alternative ways to generate attention. We did a, an experiment called Honest Cities. We set up in 12 cities a freestanding booth with bottles, and it said it's an honor system, a dollar a bottle. We'll see how honest people are. And uh, to our great delight, uh, most of the country was in the high 90 percent honest, uh, but it was also a great way to get media coverage, and we were on the Today Show and, and certainly raised a lot of awareness. The other uh, benefit of operating on a tight budget is you make less expensive mistakes. We certainly made some doozies over our 14 years, but uh, if we had had more money, we would just would have you know, spent more money trying to correct those mistakes rather than just recognizing when something wasn't working. Unlike most acquisitions, which involve relocations and layoffs, when Coca-Cola invested in Honest Tea, we created a structure where we continue to base in, in Bethesda, and our headcount has actually doubled since Coke invested uh, three years ago. And, our, and we've been expanding jobs around the country. Last October, I cut the ribbon on a Coca-Cola-owned bottling facility uh, that created 100 manufacturing jobs in Massachusetts. Next month, we're launching a new bottling line in California. When we took in Coke's initial investment, we were in 15,000 stores. Today, Honest Tea can be found in over 80,000 stores. And we just signed on another new chain uh, this morning. So we're still growing. Unlike so many industries, the beverage business is one where outsourcing isn't an issue. There's no way to ship bottles through those internet cables. And the math doesn't favor manufacturing the product overseas and then shipping it across, you know, into this market. And there's still no substitute for the role that skilled professionals, maybe a little aggressive, can play in protecting a beverage shelf. So how did the federal government help Honest Tea? The best thing I can say is that the government didn't get in the way of us launching our business. Of course, we had to make sure all our bottling plants and suppliers were licensed with the FDA and USDA. We filed our stock offerings to accredited investors through the relevant entities and, and pay our taxes through ADP. But other than that, we were left to build our business. One way the government did support our growth is through the creation of the USDA organic standards. Having a differentiated product was key to Honest Tea's survival. And the USDA organic seal, which appears on all of our products, um, helps consumers seek out products grown without chemical pesticides or fertilizers. It's a great example of a government program that helps establish a quality standard without any mandates or large bureaucracy. 
My experience building Honest Tea represents all that is great about the American economic system. A group of passionate entrepreneurs and patient investors combining their dreams, their investment capital, and their energy to create something out of nothing, delivering jobs, strong investment returns, and healthier beverages along the way. In terms of supporting the development of more companies like ours, I would say the best policy is to let entrepreneurs and investors continue to take well-informed risks. By definition, the work we do is challenging. If it were easy or obvious, the big companies would have already done it. But at Honest Tea, we take two proverbs to heart, the, first, the Chinese proverbs. The first is, if we don't change the direction we are headed, we will end up where we are going. And I believe entrepreneurs are our nation's best chance to change and make an impact on the issues that confront our society. And if that's not easy work, it, and that's why we pay attention to the second proverb, which is on the wall of our office in Bethesda. Those who say it cannot be done should not interrupt the people doing it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Goldman. Our next witness is Heath Hall, who's the president of Pork Barrel Barbecue in, here in uh, Washington. Uh, Mr. Hall co-founded the company in 2009. Its barbecue sauce is available in over 3,000 stores in 40 states. Uh, in November, the company opened a restaurant in Alexandria, uh, Virginia. Widely recognized as a winning entrepreneur on the television show uh, Shark Tank, Mr. Hall is known for his innovative approach in st to starring and growing successful businesses. I received his bachelor's degree from Truman State University and his JD from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. So, welcome. Thank you, Chairman, Ranking Member, and members of the committee. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, small businesses and the entrepreneurs who create them fuel the engine that drives the American economy and determines the overall health of our nation. Uh, it's an honor to return to Capitol Hill, where I once served as senior legislative assistant to a guy who I see is looking at me as I'm testifying, uh, Senator Jim Talent, uh, former chairman of this distinguished committee. Uh, but more importantly, it's an honor to be back because this is really where the genesis of Pork Barrel Barbecue uh, was formed. In 2006, during a Senate budget debate, my business partner Brett Thompson and I were debating what we would be having for dinner. And as I'm sure many of you have struggled to find some good options late at night here on Capitol Hill, we were wishing and hoping and, and thinking about the great barbecue joints back in Missouri that uh, we often frequented when back home. And there just weren't any here. And so uh, at that moment, uh, the Senate was debating pork barrel spending projects on the floor, a vigorous debate. And as we were vigorously debating dinner, the two ideas merged and pork barrel barbecue was formed. So. We like to say that at least one thing came out of Congress that night that was good. Um, no offense. Um, <laughs> uh, in the few minutes I have today, I'd like to talk about three key issues that every entrepreneur faces on their journey to creating a successful and small business. Uh, those include risk assessment, access to capital, and increasing their, uh, their visibility and identity. Uh, the first um, risk assessment, uh, you know, there's a critical point where every small businessman and entrepreneur uh, founding those businesses have to make the decision to move forward and invest their own time and money with zero guarantee of getting anything back. For most, those include, uh, like us, those include questions of, you know, where are we going to get the funding? How are we going to be known? Where are we going to secure retail outlets and customers? Uh, the second is access to capital. Uh, for many, if not most, getting through this challenge means spending the pre a lot of precious capital on understanding the system. Um, and it didn't take us too long to realize that we needed every ounce of capital that we had, uh, and most of that coming from our own pockets, uh, in order to do this process and do it right. And because we had such limited funds, uh, in addition to limited access to additional capital, we decided that we would take nothing out of our company from the beginning uh, until a point when we could, um, and we're still at that point today where we've realized no profits ourselves. Everything we've made, we've reinvested into the company. Um, and it's, I think it's important right here to note that you know every extra regulation, requirement, and delay that the government imposes is a burden that new small businesses have to overcome. These burdens cost time and money and often lead to many small businesses prematurely calling it quits, opting to create fewer jobs, or slowing down their innovations. I'm not saying that none of the regulations are necessary or justified. They, are, they often are. But I do want the committee to understand that they come at a cost in time and money which small businesses must pay and which could not be used for them generating uh, jobs and growing their company. The third is the need to increase that brand identity. Uh, the challenges for most entrepreneurs in doing this uh, is it's on a shoestring budget. For us, we accomplished it through social media. And uh, in a stroke of luck, we were contacted by the producers of the hit reality show Shark Tank on ABC. 
Um, and that really changed the future of our company. Uh, we were given the opportunity to, pre to present our product in front of sharks, and uh, we got a deal from Barbara Corcoran, the New York real estate giant, um, and she is currently still a, a valued member of our company and business partner. And it, so it gave us some capital, and it also gave us instant national exposure that we could have never afforded. Um, you know, I, I set before you today 100 percent certain that we would not be in the position we are were it not for Shark Tank, uh, which kind of sounds strange. The TV show could do that for you, but uh, it really has. Um, our second break came when we met a guy named Hunt Burke of Burke and Herbert Bank over in Alexandria, Virginia, a bank that believes in entrepreneurs and believed in us. Uh, and he gave us the, uh, the initial seed money after the, the show to really uh, address all of the new retail accounts that we were quickly gaining. Um, it's also important to note, I think, right here, that large businesses play an important role in the success of small businesses. Harris Teeter, a local grocery store on the East Coast, picked us up before we were known. Um, Costco, a real contributor to cultivating small businesses in this country, um, picked us up. Safeway has been a huge supporter with unsubsidized promotions and ads that we could have never afforded. Um, although I don't have any specific policy re recommendations of the committee, I would say that in my opinion, the average entrepreneur does not expect or want to be unregulated. We take quality and safety very seriously. We take pride in offering an affordable gourmet product that is high quality, good tasting, and safe for people to consume and is produced by manufacturers that are current and have scored high on all required inspections. The problem, in my view, is that there is no effective safeguard in the system to make sure the regulations are written and enforced in a way that minimizes the burden of honest, well-intentioned entrepreneurs. One approach I would encourage the committee to look into would be for the government to adopt a, partisan, uh, a partnership approach to regulation whenever possible. In these cases, it seems far more productive and less costly to all parties to partner with these businesses rather than adopting an adversarial attitude that leads to costly fines for mistakes that would make it good faith and that had no impact on public health or safety. I would like to re reiterate that America is still the land of opportunity, and what, uh, when given the chance, an entrepreneur's idea combined with the power of the free market can lead to amazing things. If America is to emerge from its economic woes, it will be on the back of entrepreneurs. Elected officials like yourself should keep in mind the sacrifices and risks entrepreneurs take when considering ways to increase the number of successful small businesses in America. It is the entrepreneur who has taken all the risk and invests his or her time and money into that endeavor with no guarantee of return. If small businesses are not allowed to enjoy the benefit of success when it happens, they will never take the risk of failure. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Clinton Times the State Director of the Delaware Small Business Development Center Network, headquartered at the University of Delaware. In this role, Mr. Times is responsible for long-range planning and program development for the statewide network. Prior to joining the Small Business Development Center, he owned and operated his own office equipment business. He received his bachelor's and MBA degrees from Wilmington College. Welcome. I was instructed early and got all ready. Chairman Graves, Ranking Member Velasquez, and members of the committee, uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, testify here today. Uh, for over 30 years, the SBDC network has been providing frontline services to entrepreneurs and small business owners while developing an infrastructure uh, dedicated to assisting uh, all business owners uh, ac across this country. How can we help uh, small business growth and innovation and help those entrepreneurs lead the economic recovery? At SBDCs, we focus on that every day. It is a basic tenet of our accreditation process uh, where we are focused, uh, where we have to develop a, a strategic plan focused on constantly improving uh, services that we provide to the small business community that is of high value and provide contemporary business solutions. Technology has changed the way most uh, businesses do businesses. So the SBDCs, we partner with firms like Google, Intuit, Microsoft, and others to bring innovation to small businesses. Guiding innovation and new technologies is an important part of our work. It may be high tech like Facebook or uh, some of the other technologies I'll talk about a little bit later, or just a different way of looking at things. Maui Jim was a simple idea, sunglasses that cut glare but didn't distort colors. But making that concept a wor worldwide success took years of working with the Illinois SBDC program. 
Likewise, at the Delaware SBTDC, we are proud to, uh, of our work with Sam Calgione of Dog Fish Head Breweries. Sam came to us with little more than an idea. He is now one of the leading microbrewers in the country, and it is not high tech, but it's made, uh, we just made sure that Sam got the basics right and got the uh, financing and funding that he needed to launch his, uh, his business. SBDCs don't necessarily know about optical coatings or jalapeno ales, but we do know marketing. We do know finance, product development, government contracting, and business planning. Our, co our clients come to us with uh, ideas, a lot of energies, and a lot of issues and, and, and problems, and they need knowledge to, to succeed. It is all about basics. All small businesses, high uh, gazelles, local mom and pop uh, organizations or companies, or third generation manufacturers are all focused on one thing, and that is the bottom line. Growth in sales, investment, and hiring are just key uh, indicators. We see several significant areas where entrepreneurs need help finance, technology development, and education. And let me give you a few examples of, uh, of those. Many SBDCs work specifically to assist uh, firms in the high-tech arena. The Delaware SBIR program is designed, is a program that we developed, is designed to help knowledge-based firms and entrepreneurs compete and win Federal SBIR and STTR uh, funding. For almost a quarter century in Delaware, uh, we led the, uh, the nation in um, uh, patents and uh, PhDs per capita. But one of the things that we were lacking in Delaware and we lagged behind was uh, the number of startups and technology-based businesses, uh, as well as lagging behind in uh, the number of SBIR application and, and awards. And hence we uh, responded and developed this program. It was designed to be a one-stop shop to assist entrepreneurs in every aspect of uh, the SBIR program. We helped them with the application strategies. Uh, we provided uh, uh, proposal uh, writing workshops. We uh, critiqued uh, the uh, review the proposal editorially as well as technically before it's uh, submitted. We provided a, a mentoring program uh, for uh, for applicants as well. Um, all of these are designed to help uh, the businesses achieve uh, achieve their goals. The Delaware SBTDC, like many SBDCs are hosted by research institutions that work closely with their technology transfer offices, uh, science and engineering departments. At the University of Delaware, we formed a special uh, group called the Office of Economic Innovation and Partnerships, where we merge uh, the technology transfer office as well as the SBTDC program together so that, uh, you know, we have the, the, the technical side uh, in terms of uh, research and commercial application, our business expertise helps to expedite those technologies from lab to the marketplace. So it's a unique, a unique model. I've also attached a letter from uh, Mr. Jian Lin of Spectrum Magnetics, and in his letter, uh, he outlines the the knowledge gaps that uh, that he and his companies have, and many entrepreneurs, and uh, how our uh, our team helped them. This is just one example of how SBDCs help businesses develop and commercialize technologies. Similar programs are being conducted in North Carolina, Texas, Missouri, Michigan, just to name a, uh, just to name a few. The second aspect is financing. We often work with entrepreneurs who have little idea about financing. Many high-tech clients don't know how to approach an angel investor. We've heard that, you know, here, uh, and uh, don't even know what an angel investor is. And there is a huge gap there, and we help those business owners uh, to speak finance, if you will. At SBDCs, we bring relationships uh, from all like, uh, walks of uh, life in terms of financing, whether it be a microloan, a uh, 504 loan, or angel investors, and in trying to, uh, to match them. In San Antonio, the SBDC hired, uh, helped their third generation uh, company, Kiobasa, to with a 504 loan that expand their uh, their firm and uh, triple the number of, uh, of employees. SBDC identifies the, an entrepreneur, entrepreneur's strength and their weaknesses, and we teach them how to relate to the financial community and find the right tools and the right financing uh, program that best meets uh, their needs. Education is the, is the third component. 
And it's a, it's a common theme that, uh, that we have and, and entrepreneurs need. Uh, we've heard uh, just a few moments ago, it's about skills and enhancing those skills and building those skills. Well, that's what SBDCs do through our one-on-one -on -one uh, counseling programs and through our training, uh, training programs. We teach them techniques to show them the, uh, the tools they need. Uh, ideas, dreams, and innovations can all fail without knowledge. We can, work, uh, we can work to overcome these, uh, how can we work to overcome these knowledge gaps? Uh, you maximize the, the tools at hand. Uh, currently, our, uh, our association and, and network uh, uh, work with uh, HUD's Office of Community Development, SBA's Office of Surety Bond uh, Guarantees and the Surety Bond Association. Our goal to educate small contractors on obtaining surety bonds and getting contracts on HUD uh, funded contracts. Not a new program just teaching financial skills. In conclusion, the ASBDC believes uh, most, uh, the most common concern of small businesses are the lack of capital, lack of sales, and difficulties in dealing with day-to-day -day, uh, complexities of their business. Some surveys say that uh, capital is bound for the qualified. We help get them qualified, the small business owners. As a result, nearly $4 billion in financing was assisted in terms of SBD assistance nationwide. Small businesses say that sales are weak. We help them develop markets and new products. In 2009-2010, uh, our network, um, our client in our network, is uh, their sales are four times that of the national average there. If, you don't, if we don't know how to do it, we'll get resources to do it. We understand that resources are available and we understand how to leverage those resources to help uh, business owners become successful. Uh, thank you for letting me share my views uh, about our network and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Times. Um, I'm very familiar with the role of the SBDCs uh, in Missouri. In fact, Max Summers is here, who's the state director of the Missouri uh, SBDCs, which I've worked with for a long time. Long time. And uh, I appreciate the work you all do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. West, we'll open with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks to the distinguished panel for being here. And Mr. Goldman, thanks for not giving us any of your honest tea, because I'm sure it will be an <laughs> ethics violation. Well, if you I have some to. bottles here. <laughs> no. I'm happy to buy. <laughs> we have to get rid of the cameras if you do get them. <laughs> Just $1.50 right. per bottle. <laughs> okay, I think I got that. Um, you know, when I travel the district down in South Florida, uh, up U.S. Highway 1, you see many closed storefronts. And, of course, that represents, you know, 8, 10, however many Americans that uh, once worked there. You know, there's a budget resolution proposal up here about taking, you know, those six tax uh, brackets and combining them down in two, and that top tax bracket being at 25 percent. What I'd like to know is if we adopted that budget resolution proposal of having that top tax bracket at 25 percent, as we know, small businesses, entrepreneurs, start off as subchapter S, LLCs, what would that do? for the growth of small businesses in the United States of America. And I understand that, I mean, we close some of those, you know, tax breaks, loopholes, but what would that 25 percent top bracket do? So, so a couple thoughts. I think, you know, first off, it's, as you know, you know, 75 percent of the small businesses have no payroll. So I think it's, as I mentioned earlier, and then the 25 percent are really generating the sales receipts and even a smaller percentage of that. So I think it gets back to uh, who that would appeal to, right? Back to this notion of, at least my opinion, on high potential entrepreneurs. Tax policy is nowhere near the top of their list in terms of their concerns. It's back to capital. It's about to getting the right talent. Um, and hopefully someday, as I mentioned, they'll pay their, they want to pay their taxes. And if, if the taxes go up, they'll work harder, which is typically what you'll hear from most entrepreneurs, at least what I hear. So I think it will help those, again, back that are traditionally, let's say, small business owners that are focused on cash flow. And in, in a way, not, they want to stay small, um, but could use relief in that area. The high potential folks, on the other hand, again, it, it won't speak to their needs. So, Just to follow up on that, I think that's right. If the the year-to-year -year income isn't as much of a concern. It's the, the long term. If you were to change the capital gains rate in a significant way, that would probably make some investors less interested. But along, you know, as long as it's long if, if you were to increase. That's right, a long, especially on the long-term side. What I think I might say to that is that as an entrepreneur, any dollars that remain in my pocket are dollars that I have to invest in my company. And I think that uh, although what the, uh, the two gentlemen before me have said I agree with, um, I think that uh, all entrepreneurs would be happy to have the opportunity to have a lower 
um, burden on themselves personally because in many instances we would turn that money right back into investing in our business. Uh, I, you know, the, the clients that we see, they, they usually come to us other than, you know, tax issues, to be, to be honest with you, um, uh, you know, there. And um, I think that any uh, lower tax would be, would be beneficial. Uh, but the uh, the concerns that most of our clients are um, expanding again expanding markets uh, issues with uh, you know getting a loan at that uh, this particular point in time, but I could just say that any lower tax I'm sure would be would be beneficial. Well, and and I guess then that's the next question is, I mean when you come in and you're at level A, what keeps you from getting to level B and C? What are the primary factors or obstacles that keep you from taking it to that next level that you see out here uh, in this current economic environment? Well, often it's capital. You know, being able to, to hire more people takes capital, or, or being able to invest in new initiatives, new equipment, so that, that's, that's capital intensive. And then it is where there's sales. So for, for, for our brand, which is a consumer product, you know, Consumers having money in their pocket to spend, having consumer confidence is, is important too. Do you feel there's a lack of predictability or certainty out there? It certainly seems to have gotten better. Um, we've seen it um, in our business pretty significantly. Uh, but sir, two years ago, it was, it was a lot of people were keeping their cash in their pockets. I think one of the interesting things that we found is that the more successful we've gotten, the more challenges we face. Uh, you know, when you have one grocery store chain picking up your sauces, you're producing a few thousand dollars worth of product at a time. When you're at three or four or five thousand, you're producing uh, potentially several hundred thousand dollars worth of product at a time. So the need for capital really grows when you grow, and I think that's been one of our challenges. Although we've had more capital access as we've um, become more successful, uh, it's kind of a beast that needs to continue to be fed, and it gets more and more uh, difficult. Uh, I would like to just echo that uh, access to capital is, is, is one of the, the major ones, but there are a couple other ones that we, that we see. One is, uh, is skills, uh, skills of not only the entrepreneur, but a skilled workforce in, in trying to attract those types of, uh, of uh, the types of talent that they need to grow. And I think that this is, is uh, increasingly important with uh, technology-based based firms. Uh, in terms of attracting those, uh, those uh, individuals that have a technical background. I think that we, uh, especially at the university, uh, we see in terms of some of the companies that we're working with where the immigration issue is also uh, a problem in terms of trying to retain those, uh, those skills that are needed uh, to help those companies, companies grow. Thank you. And I yield to Ranking Member Velasquez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, this is less than $75, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. So, uh, Mr. Times, uh, Mr. Rasky, in his uh, written testimony, explained why we must learn to better identify and support the companies that have the greatest potential to succeed. So, Mr. Times, uh, as an SBC, BDC director, when an innovator comes to you with an idea, how do you assess their needs and determine how you can help them become successful? Well, it's, it's, it's a couple of ways. One is uh, when someone comes in with, with an idea, just by purely the, the conversation, uh, we have a, a, a number of assessment tools and some things that we're trying to identify. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, we're trying to identify commitment. Is that entrepreneur, is that individual committed to being an entrepreneur? Um, one of the things uh, uh, that uh, are, are one of our core values at our program, I'm sure it's the same uh, with other SBDCs across the country, we will never squash the dream of an entrepreneur. Anybody that walks through that door, mm -hmm. we will, we have tools to assess their, uh, what stage of development their idea is. We will help them uh, self-select out of the process by helping them with some research, if you, uh, if you will. But uh, it, our process in most SBDCs, uh, we have training programs to, to uh, once we've identified in, in the assessment what those skill gaps are, we have training programs to fill 
uh, those gaps, if you will. So it is a process, and most SBDCs have a process that will, uh, where a committed entrepreneur with a, uh, with a good idea mm -hmm. has a customer will percolate to the top. And you will look at a business plan? Oh, absolutely. We help them with the, uh, the, the, the business plan as well, because that's, that's critically uh, important. The, uh, we always say that the, the plan itself is not the most important document, although it's important, but it's the process that you go through. It's the questions that you have to be able to, uh, to answer as an entrepreneur, whether it be with financing, whether it be with your, your competition, whether it be with your industry. Uh, these are some important uh, things that, uh, that need to be done. And as I talked before, it's about knowledge. It's about more information uh, that, you, that, you, uh, that you have. And I'll just add one other thing, because I just wrote it down, because I, I think it was um, uh, Mr. Goldman that said that um, um, a, a, a well-informed, uh, taking a well-informed risk. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what we try to do, is provide uh, information to minimize those risks. Thank you, Mr. Times. Um, Mr. Goldman, your company undoubtedly uh, competes against large firms in your industry. What are some of the challenges you face in competing against your larger uh, companies uh, or counterparts? Yes. Well, for us, distribution was critical. We, in the beginning, uh, I was trying to distribute the product myself, and it didn't uh, get us very far. And we went to the large distributors, and they weren't interested in our product because it was to not sweet enough and, and, and probably, you know, they didn't think organic tasted good. So um, we had to go to other distributors, cheese distributors, corned beef distributors, anybody who was putting something on a truck. Uh, and so for us, distribution was a key barrier and we didn't have a way to get around it. The way we were able to succeed is we had a product that was different so that a store would take us on the shelf even if we sort of had to go through a different door. And, and um, you know, when there's such big barriers, entrepreneurs have to, have to have a unique selling proposition that gets them someone's uh, audience. Are there any benefits that you offer your employees that oh, yes. your large counterparts yeah. do not? Yes, yeah. We certainly have a very different approach to how our, we interact with our employees. Uh, because we're a health and wellness focused company, we gave all of our employees bikes to, <laughs> to ride um, a few years ago. We, we have, um, they get healthy snack pack benefits. Uh, and then, of course, the, the, the most, I think, important one to them is that they all got equity stock options uh, as we grew. So, you know, as w our company succeeded, they succeeded as well. Uh, thank you. Mr. Brasky, in your written testimony, you talk about uh, crowdsource funding mm -hmm. um, offers as an alternative uh, to credit card debt for entrepreneurs. Uh, you don't see any risk uh, for fraud and abuse? Oh, no, there's certainly risk there. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I think, you know, capital's one avenue. So, th what, you know, what's in the Jobs Act and the issues around crowdsourcing, certainly risk. So people have to be mindful of that. I think the bigger risk for the entrepreneur is most traditional venture capitalists frown upon having too many early stage angel investors. They don't want to deal with that many small investors early. So when you're talking about three, four, five hundred possible, that, that, that's not going to bode well when you go to Mr. West, your question about that A to B, when you move to that next level of capital, uh, that's really the bigger mm -hmm. risk, I think. So, you no, know, certainly it has to be, we have to be mindful about it. How do we ensure that um, investors are protected? So, to some degree, I, the, the market works pretty well. So, if you look at some of the crowdsourcing um, businesses, probably Angels List, for example, you know, it, it sort of uh, keeps itself honest. It runs a little bit like Wikipedia. People review those investors, they're rated, uh, people can comment on what's it like to work with this investor. So the market really, if, if you let it work, it kind of works itself out. Um, so that's my opinion on it. But. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hall, thank you, Mr. Rusty. Sure. Uh, you started your company out of your home's uh, basement, and now you pro uh, your product is carried over 3,000 stores, you mentioned, and 40 states. Uh, at what stage were capital infusions critical to your success? Really, uh, from the beginning, uh, you know, the, maybe the very first run uh, in 2008, um, if you knew any of our friends or families, you probably received a bottle of our spice rub. Um, and we only did about, it cost us about three or $4,000 to do that initial run of about 2,000 units. Um, once we decided we really wanted to, to make a go of it, uh, it became critical to have uh, capital for, for everything from production to um, 
you know, trademark, getting the trademarks and uh, licensing, uh, getting all the legal documents in place, uh, shipping, um, you know, it's something that you don't think about um, when you're in your home kitchen, but when you're going bigger scale, you know, it, it costs a lot to send across country a, a glass bottle with uh, 12 ounces of barbecue sauce in it. Um, once we were on Shark Tank, really was when we went from a regional D.C., Maryland, Virginia company to more of a national company, and that's really when our first big infusion needed to occur. Uh, we went from uh, 100 stores in the area uh, to you know, what seemed like 250 and then 500 and then 1,000 within a few months, and uh, that's really when the big capital infusion needed to occur because, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the smaller you are, it, it seems like there's more pressure, but I, I'm of the opinion now, the bigger you are, when you haven't really made it to that top level yet, you're getting bigger and bigger and more people want your product, so there's the pressure to produce more product, there's the pr pressure to increase the number of products that you offer in your product line. So if you have one product, you only have one product set in the warehouse. If you have six products, you have six products set in the warehouse that aren't you know, making money for you until you actually get them sold. So um, I think really that, that big step for us was when we went from more of a D.C. area company and into that uh, larger regional and eventually national. Sure. You have back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member Velasquez. Uh, Mr. Hahn? I'm curious, uh, anyone can answer this or maybe all of you. It's widely accepted or at least touted that uh, one of the mistakes we make in our educational system is we take in people from abroad, we educate them well, and we don't stamp their, uh, their graduation diploma with a green card, something I th personally think we should do, especially in STEM. Um, can, does anybody like to speak to that? I know it's a little off the subject, but... Yeah, so this is my backyard, of course, as an educator, and, and I can tell you, at least anecdotally, that it's certainly a trend. More folks are returning home uh, versus staying here. Uh, part of it is they want to go home, so I think we can't necessarily affect that. They have opportunity now in places like China and India where they can build their own dreams and stay by their families. Um, that said, certainly, if you look at engineering, for example, 75 percent of PhDs are foreign-born, as you know. Um, we need them here, and we could use them here. Um, but I think beyond that, we could also perhaps take a page from what Israel has done. You know, in Israel, of course, they train their military to code. And uh, as a result, Israel now is one of the technology powerhouses of the world. And all uh, precisely, precisely, yeah. So I think it's a combination both of immigration reform on the one hand and then developing our own talent here as well. But it's certainly uh, something I'm in favor of is developing the talent. So. Do, you, do you think, um, Mr. Goldman, you mentioned... Uh, the, the market kind of has a way of resolving its own issues. Do you think that the, the popularly popular term is a moral consequence is thrown a lot? I'm not exactly tight on what it what peop, everybody means something different by it, but uh, I think you know what I'm talking about in terms of business. What um, what are the dangers of government getting involved, and 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 how do you how do you balance that? Well, I I do think. Um, Inevitably, when the government gets involved, it's it's somehow going to be picking winners and losers, and 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 um, it, winners and losers that the market won't necessarily agree with. And so, what happens is you may see the government propping up something that isn't sustainable. Uh, I mean, from a from a business perspective. And so, uh, one of the things that's been nice about our business, 14 years, is a <laughs> although sometimes it feels like I've I've been counting in dog years. It's a relatively long time um, to build something. So. We've been growing, but if you, each year it's been able, we've been able to digest the growth, and, and as a result, we've had a lot of things that have failed. But it's the market has sort of proven it out, and, and in, whether you look at our housing markets, or, I mean, there's a lot of markets where um, we, as a, as the government was supporting them or directing them in a way that wasn't long-term sustainable. So, from my perspective, the the markets in general are the best judge of what's going to going to work. And there must be some benefits to people having to. Uh, fight through that slog through it's, that process. It, yeah. too. I mean, uh, it's a filter in and of itself. It, it is. It's a proving ground. There's <laughs> there's no entrepreneur who um, you know. All of us, you, you, you get lucky breaks, but for every lucky break, there's a lot of ones that are. You know, someone told me I was in the right place at the right time. I said, well, it took 14 years to get here. <laughs> so um, there's there's not enough lucky breaks to keep any entrepreneur in business over 14 years. Thank you. I yield back. 
Thank you, Mr. Hanna. Ms. Chu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Times, I was so glad to see that you are such an enthusiastic supporter of SBDCs. I am, too. And, um, in fact, even though we have one in the general area, I am working to get one in my area, the San Gabriel Valley in California. And I am aware that uh, these programs have to have a certain amount of uh, matching funds from the private sector. Also, that uh, overall uh, SBDCs are facing about a 10 percent cut in the budget. Um, uh, this, these, this has resulted in um, numerous centers receiving fewer funds, even though there is more client demand now for, uh, for assistance in starting businesses. And client demand, I have, would have to think, is, is especially high as more unemployed people uh, try to start their own businesses. Um, so what, is, uh, what are you doing in response to this? Um, what uh, can be done and, and our staff being uh, trained uh, to respond more effectively in this current economic downturn? Thank you for the question. Um, I, I first would like to say that, uh, you know, over the past uh, few years it has been difficult in terms of, uh, of our, our program nationally. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, we did Federal funding, but the matching component yeah. of that. And uh, that matching uh, portion not only comes from the, the private sector, but from States. And we all know how uh, the, the difficulty states have had over the past couple of years with their, with their budget. So it, it uh, you know, it's compounded, if you will, uh, you know, there as it, as it moves down. But to answer your question, it's about um, you know the way that we've been doing it. Again, uh, just like other SBDCs across the country, uh, is collaborations. I mean, that's uh, is leveraging. I mean, that's that's what we have to do. And I'll just let me just give you a, a good example, um, you know, of that. Uh, we assist technology-based businesses. Uh, we don't have in Delaware. We don't have the resources uh, to um, to hire someone that is technical, if you will, uh, to assist these types of businesses. So again, uh, what we've uh, we've done is with our the new unit at the university, we've leveraged resources with the individuals that have the technical background with our expertise, again, on the, um, uh, on the business side of it. But this is the important thing here in this, in this uh, unique model, is that not only do we assist those, uh, those individuals in terms of uh, internal to the university faculty and, and researchers, but we also have an arrangement that the university licensing associates and those technical individuals also assist us with entrepreneurs outside of the university as well. So you've got to be really creative, but at times you can only be so creative. At some point in time it catches up with you and that you're not able to uh, meet the demand that's, uh, that's out there. We, uh, you know, we, uh, collaborations, collaborations, uh, and, and leveraging resources as, as best you can. But again, it gets to a point where you, you work with organizations that have the same problems that you have. And it becomes, you know, really, really difficult at times to, uh, to keep up with the demand, uh, with the economy the way that it has been. Uh, we're just, uh, you know, flooded with, uh, with, with uh, business owners that, that come in. And uh, I'll just add this, that what happens is when you have a situation where there is an economic downturn and things get, uh, get pretty tough, uh, the time that you spend with a business increases. Because what you're doing is you're going through every aspect of that business to try to determine, number one, how can you wring out as much excess as you, as, as you can uh, there because uh, to improve cash flow. At the end of the day, that's what it's going to be all about in, 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 in there. So it has been difficult, but uh, collaborations and leveraging resources as best you can is the only way you can do it. Would the gentle lady yield for a second? Uh, Mr. Times, how do you feel about the fact that when uh, your program, the SBDC, uh, is uh, getting a cut of th re uh, reduced budget of $13 million, yet uh, the administration is creating a pilot project, uh, a pilot program, like regional clusters, mm -hmm. for $13 million at a time when we are facing budgetary constraints and you is proving, you, the network of SBDC have a proven record throughout the nation, it doesn't make sense uh, that we are going to uh, fund a program that is a pilot, is untested and unauthorized. We are on record. 
both the chairman and myself, uh, uh, telling the administration that is not the right way to go. So uh, we understand the incredible resource that you represent in our nation by providing tools and information to small businesses. And I want you to know that I support reinstating the $13 uh, million. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thing. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Chu. Ms. Hahn? Thank you, Mr. Chair Chairman. I've enjoyed uh, this hearing today and uh, the two entrepreneurs. Uh, glad you're here. And you really sort of uh, confirm what I found uh, when I've been uh, touring small businesses and meeting with them. They, they, they really talk about uh, their biggest issue is access to capital. Uh, and the other thing, I'm always like, well, what can I do for you? And they say, you know, customers. We need more customers. So uh, get the economy back on track, uh, get people back to work. And that's what we need is more customers. You know, my next my question, uh, I kind of feel like uh, one of our uh, colleagues uh, recently in another committee who said, where are the women? Uh, and and uh, Mr. Uh, Razigi, you know, in the... Um, in the 2010 Kellogg Foundation report, uh, it found that uh, overall men are substantially more likely to start businesses each month uh, than are women. And in your research, I'm wondering uh, if you found a similar uh, phenomenon. And if so, uh, are there resources that um, women uh, entrepreneurs need that aren't available, or to what do you um, uh, attribute uh, the lack of women entrepreneurs uh, that we're seeing? Yeah, so it's a great question. So I, I don't research this specifically. I can tell you that other research that I've seen, but you know, typically it's more so the types of businesses. So they're typically called lifestyle businesses, but work from home types of businesses and so on. Um, they're, because of family reasons and so on, there's a tendency to move there. Um, you know, in our experience, though, we're seeing, for example, I'm involved with an accelerator in Chicago where we have actually a predominant number of women, a uh, majority of women that are starting technology businesses. Um, so what are the hurdles there? You know, frankly, I, I don't study that subject closely enough, but I think there's certainly a trend, at least I've seen a trend moving more in that direction. But, but the big issue really are these categories of these lifestyle businesses versus these high potential types of businesses. So. You know, the, the thing is, though, at the, at the end of the day, whether you're a, um, a woman, whether you're a male, um, marketing is marketing, finance is finance, and product development is product development. At the end of the day, uh, it's the, you know, these are the basics of uh, the business basics, if, if, you, uh, if you will. There are, are some, um, uh, some, some, uh, some things there in terms of that you just mentioned. But uh, again, at the end of the day, uh, to be successful is going to take, you know, some of the same skills uh, that, uh, that anyone will need to be, to be successful. I mean, an idea that I would add to that, sort of follow on it, but, you know, what I see as an educator, and I guess I'm concerned with the pipeline of entrepreneurs, is that our best and brightest, so I'm fortunate to teach at a, at a high-ranking school, if I could be so humble, uh, in Chicago. Um, what I see typically is that their opportunity cost of walking away from their student loans is why typically either one or the other in a, in a relationship, uh, somebody has to have the full-time job while the other one goes, whether it's man or fem female. Um, to go keep the lights on while they pursue their dream. Uh, so a thought I have is, you know, why don't we offer credits towards people against their student loans for every new job they create to really change the metric? You know, some have been extreme and say, don't even go to school, just drop out and start a business. Um, there are only so many Bill Gates that we can point to that have done that and succeeded, and, and so stay in school, uh, but let's put incentives in place. So I think it's probably, if you look deeper, it's more of an economic issue than a gender issue. Hmm. Of course, I always love hearing men comment on what the issues are with women. But anyway, hey, you know, I was going to uh, talk to the two um, entrepreneurs here. One of the other things I was reading in the Kellogg report is that, interesting enough, uh, of the 15 largest cities in the country, Los Angeles uh, actually created the most uh, entrepreneurial businesses uh, in 2011, which is interesting because Los Angeles usually gets um, pegged as, you know, not business friendly and it's very difficult to do business. Wondering, from the two of you, what geography or location actually played in your 
uh, starting up, uh, where you chose to start up your businesses? Well, I'll start with that. Uh, geography has a lot to do with barbecue. Um, <laughs> I'm from Texas. I love Texas barbecue. I'm from Kansas City. That's not barbecue in, you know, in North Carolina. Oh, Memphis is the only place to get barbecue. Pork is barbecue. Beef isn't. Beef is barbecue. Pork isn't. Uh, so I think that uh, definitely there's some strategy with us in the type of product we have and the type of uh, product people in certain geographies are used to. Uh, so we kind of started out with what I would kind of consider a basic barbecue sauce. Um, that we thought would appeal to the vast majority of Americans. Um, and then, since then, we have started to create more of the regional variances. We uh, will just uh, probably in the next uh, four to six weeks be launching our newest uh, sauce, which is a Carolina vinegar sauce. Uh, we've launched a mustard sauce, which is very uh, regional. However, one of the interesting things, and you must mention Los Angeles, is uh, we introduced the mustard sauce last year, and we found that it is selling the best in California. Um, and it, the reason, I think, is because it's an unusual product for California. Uh, there is no competition, really. You don't go to the grocery store and see seven or eight mustard sauces on the shelf. You see ours. We put it on our tofu. Hey, <laughs> that's, that's fine. As long as you're buying it, you can put it on whatever you want. Um, Whereas, you know, in South Carolina, where you go to the grocery store and there may be a dozen mustard sauces on the shelf, we're now competing with 11 other products. Um, so I think that uh, maybe, you know, uh, for our product, geography is definitely um, a uh, kind of a, a really important factor to figure in. And uh, one of the things also that's helped us, we've been able to partner with certain companies and, and groups uh, like Research Fine Foods out of um, Portland, Oregon, uh, a major potato salad, um, coleslaw, side dish company that's very predominant at barbecues. And being able to have our product, you know, um, mentioned with theirs has helped integrate us into their, their um, customer base because they trust Reesers. They know it's a good product. They see we're associated with it, and they are willing to take a chance. But it's really tough in the food industry. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's the same way with teas. You know, when you have companies like uh, Sweet Baby Ray's and Kansas City Masterpiece and Kraft that are spending billions, it seems like. It's probably not that, but that's what it seems like. And running 10 for $10 or $0.76, cents, uh, you really have to find ways to distinguish yourself. And uh, we do that through what we think is a higher quality product. Uh, we like to call ourselves affordable gourmet. For, uh, for uh, me, it made, I was working at a company called Calvert Group, which does environmentally responsible mutual funds. And uh, I started out, out of my house, so I just stayed in the same place. And it's very often you'll see one business sort of be the, the nucleus where others sort of come off, and maybe not directly related, and obviously that's what Silicon Valley is. I will say, just as a parenthetical, that um, a lot of startup entrepreneurs in the beverage industry are very afraid of California because of the consumer uh, uh, friendly laws. <laughs> Um, and and uh, we've we've seen that uh, you know that's a state that is very intimidating to start up businesses, at least in the food space. Mm. Great, thank you. If there are any other members have any other questions, we're about to have a vote call. Mr. Hanna. Mr. Times, what what's your failure rate? Failure rate? Bro go broke rate, whatever you want to. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't work out. That doesn't. That don't work out. To be honest with you, I, I, in Delaware, we have not tracked that. To be to be honest with you, um, I I can say say this that uh, anecdotally, uh, that, that's all I can can say. Those that have have worked with our programs uh, have uh, have uh, have done fairly well. I would I would say uh, it, that that's a difficult one to uh, to to to. To measure, uh, let me give you a good example. Um, over the past couple of years, um, we'll get a referral from a bank where an entrepreneur business is in trouble, and we've got to work to try to turn that that business around as best we uh, you know best we can. And sometimes it works, and sometimes you know it. It it doesn't, and uh, so is it is, is it a failure? Ah, you know, another thing that's hard to 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 measure is especially in a startup situation. Um, person comes through, we go through a training program, um, starting out in business, uh, 
Um, we work with them, and through our process, they self-select out and find out that, you know, maybe I better not start this business. Mm -hmm. Maybe I better not do it. Maybe I better save some more money. Maybe I better get some, some more experience. And they don't start it up. So you ask yourself the question, is that a success or is that a failure? In my eyes, I think it's a success. But, you know, they don't, that, that individual never start a job, I mean, start a company. They'll never hire any employees at this particular point in time. All right? So a lot of times that's kind of hard for us to, to, to measure, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, on behalf of Chairman Grays and the Ranking Member Velasquez, we want to thank you all for being here participating today. And the committee will continue to follow closely uh, and research on the nation and the needs of our entrepreneurs who are definitely our country's best job creators. I ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record without objection that is so ordered. And this hearing is now adjourned.